We have a couple gentlemen here that I want to call up. One is a longtime attorney, Charles Wilkinson. He's a professor at Colorado, University of Colorado, longtime friend of Billy Frank Jr., longtime friend of Indian Country long-time friend of the environment and preserving those gifts that nature has provided, has written 14 books on law, some of those on Indian law, and I want to say is a good friend. I'm going to ask Charles to come up and share some words, but I also want to call up Bill Wilkerson at the same time because we're going to open up opportunity to ask some questions. Bill is the former uh, uh, state fish and wildlife director from back in way back, <laughs> 82 to 86. And in 1982, I was a lot younger as well. But I remember going with my father, Bernie Gobin and Stan Jones, Shohalem, to meetings. One of those was in uh, Port Ludlow, I believe it was. And uh, Bill was the director there. He was kind of new and he was feeling his way through um, the Bolt decision. Because the Bolt decision was in 74 and this is 82 and a lot of turmoil in those first years. And Bill was doing his job for Washington State, arguing the state's position, some of them the old positions. But in the course of that meeting, you could see the change. I think there might have even been a chair thrown in that meeting somewhere. But, the, uh, but you could see a change that started to come, come about. One of trying to figure out this isn't working we need to find a web, a different way of doing it. You could, you could actually see that starting to take place. And that's what Bill brought forward in his term at Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. One of figuring that we can't keep fighting. We got to figure out ways that we're going to work together. We got to figure out ways to do this collaboratively. We got to get a team that's willing to stand and do this together. And he brought about that vision. He brought about a change in mindset, which wasn't very popular within Washington State at the time. But he's not deviated from that. So I want to ask both of you to come up, share your thoughts on where we're at, talking about the history of how we got to where we are today and what you've learned along the way, the importance of those treaty rights, the importance of co-management and working together and how, where you see those successes. What worked as we look for what might work today as we continue to go forward. Good morning. Um, I'm so glad you're doing this today. I, I, I think it is needed and uh, people have been stating uh, very eloquently why and I'll look forward to uh, the results uh, over time. Um, yes, I was one of the ones lucky enough to spend a lot of time with Billy. I'm from Boulder, Colorado, about a thousand miles east of here and our restaurants are a little bit different. And there are a whole lot of waiters and waitresses and a few managers actually who were stunned and taken aback to have this person giving them a tirade about how the hell can you be selling Atlantic salmon?
It's a pleasure for reasons that uh, Glenn mentioned to be here with Bill uh, Wilkerson and what he and Billy accomplished uh, in the early uh, 80s in particular really was historic and is still benefiting us uh, today. Uh, the uh, people who have spoken already, I think, have been so helpful, and it, it makes it easier, I think, for both me and Bill, because you've covered uh, some important uh, points, and I think maybe I can move along a bit quicker than I had uh, uh, planned on speaking. Um, uh, what I hope uh, for people who are on the younger side um, is this. Um, there are a good number here who, who were around when the Bolt decision was handed down. And it has great meaning to them, and they, and they lived it. They lived it. But many of you haven't. It was 45 years ago. But what I ask, because I think it is so fundamental to the future of your peoples, that you work hard and, and, and try to listen and watch and read about the Bolt decision and try to feel it. Try to feel it. And it, 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 it should help you that it was your ancestors who brought it to court and, uh, and who prosecuted it and made it work and made, extended the bold decisions because of the promises of, of, of sovereignty and the treaties into other areas. And that uh, uh, this, you, you literally wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't be here today without the Bolt decision. That, that this facility wouldn't exist. So much came out of it. Um, and it should be such a great pride of, of you as tribal members of Northwest Washington tribes because um, the Bolt decision, again, that you accomplished. Judge Bolt did an accomplishment. He was a great judge and did a historic job. It's the, 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 the Bolt decision, many people would say, is the single most important court decision handed down in the Pacific Northwest ever. And, and it, it uh, stands along with Brown against Board of Education, the Supreme Court's great case on uh, the unconstitutionality of segregation. It stands right with Brown against Board of Education as one of the two or three greatest cases ever handed down in the name of dispossessed people in the United States. And your people did that. Your people did that. And it really is a job of yours to keep it alive. And, and, and the thing is, there, there's just beauty and joy and humor in doing that. And, and Billy helped that so much. He, he, he always had those things uh, that he was expressing. And, uh, and you can too. And it's, it's, uh, it's going to be a lot of work ahead but your people have always been willing to do that. And uh, I was going to say, I hope. I know you'll keep doing it. But, but it is harder, I think, for young people to, to get to the position where, oh, yeah, I, I get the Bolt decision and all that's come from it. And, and I'm going to learn from it, and I'm going to be a warrior for it, the way the people who came before did. Uh, judge Bolt uh, was an Eisenhower appointee, a conservative judge, a law and order judge, a judge that the tribal attorneys wondered if they shouldn't try to get him disqualified early on. But, but they backed off that, and it's, it's great they did, because Judge Bolt started hearing and reading about, reading about the history and hearing from some of the tribal elders, and and, and he, uh, in, and the decision came down in, in early 1974, and um, he finally put his other cases on hold 
because he knew this was going to be the most important decision of, of his entire tenure, which it was. And he had tried a number of major cases, but, but he knew this was going to be the one. And one thing in terms of just understanding the situation better is that his law clerk has been very generous in granting interviews uh, about Judge Bull and what he was thinking and doing during those times. And uh, he called uh, his law clerk into the office one time and said, bring me every book on Indian law. Now today, you wouldn't be able to do that because the Bolt decision was one of part of the modern Indian revival that has created a whole hell of a lot of Indian law. And, and uh, it would be a big job to try to bring in all the books. You couldn't do it, but you could back then. And Judge Bolt uh, 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 took them on and, and, and decided he was going to master this field, which he did. And um, he looked to the uh, Cherokee decisions in the early 1830s. And those of you who may be in college now or getting ready to go to college, uh, tr try to find a course and it doesn't have to be Indian law, but because the Indian decisions are taught in a lot of different courses now. But, but try to get an excuse to learn about the John Marshall Indian law decisions involving the Cherokees, because um, he was our greatest justice. Was at the beginning, always will be. And so uh, uh, Indian law, he gave Indian law its early foundation. And, and so he's part of Indian history, uh, our greatest justice. And uh, what he did was the, the state of Georgia just decided it was going to outlaw the Cherokee Reservation. They were going to split it up among the local counties. They made it illegal for the tribal council to meet, uh, punishable uh, by pr imprisonment under state law, or to en engage in a, in a tribal court uh, decision. And they said that Georgia law extended onto the uh, reservation. And so one person got, uh, got murdered in Cherokee. And they, they took him into state court. He should have gone to tribal court or, and tribal ways. The Cherokees knew how to handle these things. But Georgia took it on, even though it took place on the reservation. Georgia said there isn't a reservation. We obliterated it. And so the case went to the Supreme Court, and, and, and the, the uh, attorneys for the defendant uh, asked for a writ to bring the case up to the Supreme Court, and the court granted it. And Georgia hung corn tassel, the, 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 the defendant, in spite of the fact that the case was in the Supreme Court. And so then when Worcester against Georgia came up, the case uh, actually brought by missionaries who wanted to, uh, and the Cherokees wanted them to, uh, to come in, but the governor wouldn't allow them in. And so the mis missionaries were given jail sentences. And in that case, the uh, state of Georgia was so um, uh, 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 angry uh, with John Marshall, the Supreme Court, the federal government, and the Cherokee tribe, that they refused to file a brief in the case. They refused to file a brief. And then when it was time for oral argument, they refused to appear, flaunting the Supreme Court, trying to give the Supreme Court a slap in the face. Fortunately, the Cherokee lawyers, and, and your lawyers would have done the same thing, uh, said, uh, if the court please, may we have the time of the Georgia uh, lawyers, and we'll be glad to argue for an extra four hours, which they did. Um, but then Marshall handed down Worcester against Georgia, which is an anthem for Indian country, because that's where the uh, uh, tribal sovereignty became not just a reality in Indian country, because you've always had it, but it became embedded in federal law in Worcester against Georgia. And, uh, and Marshall 
said that they are a distinct people occupying the territory, called, called the tribes nations, which accurately they are uh, and were at that time. And then finally said that the, the Indian country is a place where the law of the states can have no effect. And it's under tribal sovereignty. Now, by the way, that has been weakened over the years by Congress, by some later Supreme Court decisions. But of course, for most purposes, it still is a place where state law uh, can't, can't apply. And so, um, um, and, 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 and also the court in Worcester upheld the Cherokee treaties. And so, um, basically, I, I, I would say that the uh, 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 Supreme that the, that the that the Bolt decision had uh, uh, finality in in just in in a few critical areas. One, in spite of the fact that many people in Washington, many state officials, and the lawyers came close to this, said these treaties are outmoded. They're a century and a quarter old, and you just can't enforce them anymore. And, and, and Judge Bull came down strong and said, no, the treaties are still in effect, still valid. And, and you've heard already several testimonials on how important those, those treaties um, are to you. Uh, secondly, it upheld the 50% share that, that your lawyers and tribal leaders and, and Billy and the others were working with the tribal lawyers very close, uh, the, the U.S. lawyers very closely during this case and with the tribal lawyers. Um, and, um, uh, and, and wanted that 50% and were willing to fight for it and willing to realize that it seemed like a lot and it was taking a chance. It was a big chance, a, a gamble. To, 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 to go for the 50 percent, but, but they did it and Judge Bolt upheld it in common with. And what you realize in order to appreciate the honesty of the opinion, it's the opinion isn't a reach. The tribes, leader after leader, came up at, at the treaty and said, we've got to have our salmon. We don't want to give up this much land. But we understand that there's a matter of force here, and, 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 and you're going to get some land, but, but you have to provide that on the rest of it that's going to be open for settlement, we can take salmon and hunt and gather. And, and they, they, of course, put it very eloquently. And Isaac Stevens, um, one of the real beauties of uh, Indian history, uh, the uh, superintendent at that time, uh, the territorial governor of, of uh, uh, the territory, um, actually said very, oh, because he knew he had to compromise. He knew that, that he could get land, and oh, he wanted that land. But he was going to have to comply with the, the tribal leaders' clearly stated position at the treaties that, that they wanted fishing rights in common with um, and continue to have their way of life um, on the land that, that was uh, ceded. And, um, uh, uh, and, and, and so uh, uh, Stevens actually said at more than one treaty session, this paper secures your fish. Now that's a promise that, 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 that's clearly understood. And boy, let me tell you, and, and again, for those of you going off uh, to college or, or, or otherwise and interested in reading, the, the, the extent of your uh, marine, not just salmon, but, but marine activities was unbelievable. And, 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 and you were operating on a scale that any modern corporate leader is going to say was amazing. 
in, in your efficient use and, and, and the amount of fish you were taking out. You, you were taking out many, many more fish than are being taken out today, and it, you were sustainable. There wasn't any question about it. Nobody claims you weren't sustainable. And, and, and yet you took out immense amounts, and your trade was so extensive. The macaw, hundreds of miles north, hundreds of miles south along, along the coast. The other coastal tribes, very, very active also. And then inland, over the Continental Divide, trading with inland tribes, going to Celilo Falls um, in, in the summer to meet with tribes from, from all over the West. And uh, uh, your reach was amazing. And so when, when Bolt saw this and saw how substantial your dependence was and, and how admirable your uh, uh, fishing practices were, um, and the promises that had been made, and the fact that it's in common with, and there's a, 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 a dictionary two years after the Bolt decision, or after the, the, the treaties, that said common means equal. And so it ended up being 50%. I want to mark down one thing um, that, that uh, you all know instinctively or, or from having lived through it. Um, this This had an immense impact on the non-Indian economy of Northwest Washington because you, you were going from two, three, or four percent of the fishery up to 50 percent. And it's held. It's held. And, but that means the non-Indians had to come down from 92, 93, 94 percent down to 50 percent. And a lot of boats went out of business. And a lot of coastal towns were broken, it looked like, although they've come back now. But at that time, it was a, it was a major um, impact. And this is one reason that the Bolt decision was so great and, and, and the tribes were so uh, visionary in their request and Judge Bolt was so visionary. But it really is rare. Most court opinions for dispossessed people make changes on the edges. They, and they can be important changes. But this was, I mean, this was rearranging a, a, an economy. I mean, at this time, people said that the economy in Northwest Washington was timber, Boeing, and salmon. And you're rearranging 50% of, of, of the salmon resource. And it was an unbelievable accomplishment and, 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 and is, is one of the many reasons that the Bolt decision is so luminous and, and, and has been so important over time. Then, in addition, um, uh, Judge Bolt held that the tribes had sovereignty. And again, because uh, we uh, who have been around a few years, um, I love to go to potlucks and now because uh, those lines are really short, you know. <laughs> um, but, but we do think of the, of, of the uh, young people, and I hope all of you uh, will work hard on this notion of sovereignty and understanding it, because what, what a sovereign is is a government. It's a direct synonym for governments. It's not a corporation which, which, which cannot enact laws and enforce them. Sovereigns enact laws and enforce them over their territory, and you have that sovereign right. And in the United States of America, there are three kinds of sovereigns. The United States, the states, with their counties and cities uh, underneath them, and Indian tribes. And your land base is very substantial, and when you take the national Indian land base, it is uh, over 60 million acres in the lower 48, um, and is, is almost as large as, uh, as the state of Colorado. So it is a significant sovereignty, and when people come into Indian country, they now are under a different culture and, and, and set of ways. 
And, and, I, and I, I just want you uh, young people to be proud of that and, and, and to know it and understand it uh, to, to an, a degree that makes you satisfied and that you really can say we're sovereign and I understand why. And, uh, uh, and so what happened was, and again, this was the first big sovereignty case for Indian people in modern times. And all tribes had been down. You know that, how far down they'd been. And I can't tell you how far back that you have come because there aren't words for it. There aren't words to describe how the operation we have here today is different than uh, it was uh, two generations ago. And, 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 the, and, and, and the people who are in college, the Indian people who are, who are in school, and have good jobs. Um, and there's, we, we know there's plenty of things still need to be done, plenty of things, including the exact subject we're talking about today. But uh, don't lose track and, and pride over what you have um, um, accomplished. And so what your tribes started to do right away was to set up governmental uh, 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 mechanisms. And so, you started in, 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 in salmon harvesting and you, you developed codes, statutes, root laws for, take, for tribal members taking salmon. Um, um, and then you set up tribal courts. M most of you at that time did not have tribal courts. Some of you did, but most didn't. And the existing tribal courts expanded. And, and then you went from there to uh, health and housing and, and uh, all manner of governmental areas of interest and became full-blown governments. And so now uh, most of your governments are sovereign governments, leaving aside uh, enterprises, have uh, 200, 300 employees or more. And, and back then you'd have one, two, three employees or zero. Um, and so um, that kind of sovereignty spread. And the other thing you did, and oh boy, has this been historic to all the citizenry of Washington, is you started setting up your scientific staffs right away, right after the Bolt decision. Governments have the responsibility of, of, of having scientifically sound programs. And so you set up your scientific offices, and boy, did you succeed. And, and all across the country, uh, Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission is, is just widely uh, uh, praised and acknowledged. And you've got, I guess, some 50 fishery scient scientists in Olympia, and then every tribe has your own staff on the reservations. And taken as a whole, your tribes in this government-to-government -government relationship <clears throat> have just slightly fewer uh, fishery scientists than the, the United States of America has in Washington, and you have more than the state of Washington has. And your data that's coming out of the rivers is, 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 uh, uh, is, is essential to co-management. Because uh, you, you've got, you understand well the different geographic areas that the salmon cover, but, but the rivers, the inland areas, is a critical habitat. And, um, and, and it's your scientists that are putting out the data on that, and, 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 and data is what drives good scientific uh, decisions. And that, though, that, that benefits everybody in, in Washington. The uh, scientific work uh, you are doing, and the last thing that 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 you have uh, contributed to the, and and I'm going to call it sacred campaign to restore and preserve the salmon that uh, the tribes are involved with, the states are involved with, conservation organizations, other groups, ordinary citizens. But, but, but the tribes make very significant contributions. And 
um, and, and I've, I've mentioned some. I, I want to just real quickly say the culvert case is in the Supreme Court now. And I think it's not well understood. I don't think it's well understood how, how uh, big the impacts these culverts have on the salmon runs. Because culverts, it isn't like a dam. Somebody can say, we got to take this dam out to help the salmon, and that makes sense to everybody. Then maybe they think it's too expensive or not, but they understand, yeah, obviously, if you take the dam out. But culverts are kind of vague. People don't, they're, they're, a lot of people don't know what a culvert is. And in fact, of course, when you take a culvert the, 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 that's a dead culvert and the fish can't get through, you have closed off all the habitat up above. And we've got a thousand river miles um, that the uh, uh, culverts have blocked individually. And it's, it's some of the best habitat of all. And so when you take a small river and put a culvert that's a blockage culvert, then you've got smaller tributaries up above. You've got all this wonderful forest land. It's all lost to the salmon. So, so this is really an important case, and the state is recognized. It was a state study that pointed out the, the effects of culverts, and it was the tribes who picked it up and took it to the Supreme Court. And, and, and again, that helps everybody, and um, is an example of how, how tribes have, have uh, been such leaders in this. And um, the last thing I, I want to mention that... that, that is, is, is real about the modern uh, uh, salmon recovery movement in Washington is the tribal voice. Authentic, knowing, and often very engaging. You've already seen um, uh, uh, the, the, the tribal voice for, for maybe those of you who are not Indians and, and haven't had the the chance to see what you've already seen here. Uh, uh, Fawn Sharp is, is I, I think, one of the most important public intellectuals in, in, uh, in the Northwest. And she has uh, learned, doing a lot of her own study uh, about climate change, and, and, and she knows it top to bottom, and she can explain it top to bottom to the public. And you've heard from Glenn and, and several others already, and, and you've seen the, the the, the young people bring the salmon in, and that's part of the Indian voice. And, um, and, and I think Billy, Billy's voice is still alive and, and is always going to be. And, and we're going to keep hearing him um, or feeling him um, in, the, in the times to come. And, and I want to finish off just by reading one passage. Part of that passage is on these banners. But... Um, this uh, uh, came out, you said I did 14 books. I don't know how many books I did, but I know what my favorite book was that I did. It's called Messages from Frank's Landing, requiring me to have something like almost 100 hours of interviews with uh, a certain Billy Frank Jr. Whoa. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 but this is, I want to make this clear. This isn't a speech Billy gave. And, and there wasn't a camera, and we were just uh, late at night sitting in his kitchen on stools at, at, at the counter, drinking coffee and, and talking. And uh, all of a sudden, I, I heard him say this, and I want to say that um, in terms of a statement of a philosophy toward the natural world, this is the equal of John Muir, Aldo Leopold, and it's a compliment to them to say it's an equal because isn't this more powerful than Muir or Leopold ever was? Billy had once told me about um, going up into the National Forest and um, uh, just lying down and looking at the big ant hills that got up to three or four feet tall under the fir trees, trees, and there aren't as many up there because of the logging anymore. But that's what he did as a little boy. We talk about state sovereignty and tribal sovereignty, 
But those ant communities are sovereigns too. We've got to find a way to protect their sovereignty. Then he took it a step further. It used to be, when I was a little boy, that we could see the stars at night. Now it's much hard, harder to see the stars with all the lights from the cities and towns. That's wrong. Those stars are sovereigns. They have a right to be seen. I don't believe in magic. I believe in the sun and the stars, the water, the tides, the floods, the owls, the hawks flying, the river running, the wind talking. They are measurements. They tell us how healthy things are how healthy we are. That's because we and they are the same. That's what I believe in. Thank you, my friends. Well, thank you, Charles. Uh, it's a great honor for me uh, to come out of retirement and come to the first Billy Frank conference or Salmon Summit. Um, I must tell you, I I'd been expecting something like this to to come almost from the day since the day Billy died, and so I want to. Thank Sam and Defense and Pegan and Willie and so many of the other people that made this uh, come together. Uh, it's it's about time because the the man that this summit is named after is probably in my lifetime the greatest political leader this state has ever seen. Uh, just to hear the voice and to see the face uh, on uh, Tony's uh, film clip uh, of Billy just brought back some memories that uh, I think for all of us, uh, uh, I just hope we all recognize that this was a great man, Billy Frank. Um, I had the pleasure of getting to know Billy in the 1970s. Uh, I was a kind of a rogue attorney for the state of Washington at that time. Uh, had a, a little different view of, of the world than uh, the state attorney general and uh, helped uh, some friends uh, of mine at, at the fisheries department who uh, actually wanted to work out an agreement uh, with the Nisqually tribe uh, on some fish management and fish hatchery uh, deals. And we came to an agreement, and I, uh, because the state attorney general at that time would not represent uh, the department in, in uh, putting that agreement together, they hired me to uh, help Billy, uh, uh, A, come to agreement with, with the state, and B, then actually draft an agreement. And I think it was the last legal document that I ever drafted in my life. Uh, and it probably was pretty poorly done, frankly. It wasn't, wasn't as eloquent as the Stevens Treaties or any other agreements that you've signed over the years. But it did its job and uh, we built a, a great hatchery. We, we uh, 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 came to uh, terms on some South Sound management issues that hadn't been done before. And, uh, and we, we, we just got to know each other a little bit. And when you get to know Billy Frank, you get to know, you get to know uh, as I said, not just a great leader, but a great person. And, 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 you've, and you've found, you, you found yourself 
uh, wanting to know him better. Uh, uh, Fawn said it uh, beautifully earlier. I mean, if you if you couldn't be inspired around Billy Frank, uh, I think that you better check yourself out uh, because he was without question the most inspirational uh, and 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 effective leader that I've known. Uh, I I went on and and uh, became deputy director of uh, of what was then the fisheries department. Uh, in 1981, I went to work for a guy named Raleigh Schmitten, who was, became one of my great friends. And uh, Raleigh and I were a little bit skeptical about the approach the state was taking uh, in terms of dealing with, with uh, uh, the tribes. Uh, I, I didn't... Uh, rely on my great legal knowledge at that time uh, to be skeptical. I just saw lawyers and staff performing in a way that didn't seem very professional to me. And I saw some real professional uh, 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 technical staff and, and uh, some real professional, uh, very good lawyers uh, sitting on the uh, tribal side trying to get the Bolt decision implemented. Uh, uh, Glenn uh, said earlier, uh, we first met at, at, at a place called Port Ledlow. By that time in 1984, I was fisheries director. I had replaced Raleigh who had been uh, uh, scooped up by the governor's office, uh, Governor John Spellman at the time, and, and Spellman had, had named uh, Raleigh as Deputy Chief of Staff. And somehow I got, got the job. Well, it wasn't just somehow. One person that helped me get the job as fisheries director was a guy named Billy Frank. He, he actually went to the governor at, in 1983 and said, we, we can work with this guy. And uh, and uh, I had worked with Billy on the U.S.-Canada Treaty. I'd been working with him. We worked on a few uh, uh, crises in 1981 and 82. And he actually called the governor and said, we can work with this guy. And somehow I got the job. Uh, now, if you, if you want to know what the time was like at that point, that was pretty rare that a, that a tribal leader would even venture to even speak uh, to a state leader. We had been at war for years and years over fighting treaty, treaty rights. And, and uh, to re get a vote of confidence from a tribal leader at that time was pr pretty unusual too. We went to work. Uh, in 1983 on changing the relationship between the state and the tribes. The Bolt decision was pretty clear about something that our attorneys really never told us at the Department of Fish and Fisheries. Uh, it was clear that we had a responsibility to manage the fish with each other. Uh, and the term co-management, which had been rarely spoken up until then, uh, uh, became a kind of a buzzword. Uh, Port Ludlow, uh, as Glenn said, was where we met with tribal leaders like uh, uh, Glenn's father uh, and uh, with Forrest Kinley and, and names here in Indian country that have great meaning. Uh, Billy and had, had, had arranged uh, for a meeting uh, at the SeaTac airport with a number of tribal leaders where I went in alone and said, I'm ready to change things in terms of the relationship between the state and the tribes. But we have to do a lot of listening and learning about what you're doing to make uh, salmon important. You need to hear a lot from me about what I want to do to make salmon important in the state of Washington 
but I do think we have one thing in common. This resource is in trouble, we all know it, and we've got to do something about it. Billy had been making speeches all over the Northwest for the last three or four years before that. I started copying some of his, his speeches because he was right. He was talking about the salmon way before uh, anybody else was. And Billy talked about the, the importance of people actually working together to save the salmon. We weren't talking much about habitat in those days. We were talking about fish management. And he was building a staff, as uh, uh, Charles just told you. He was building a staff of people uh, that could manage not only the tribal fisheries, but could help us manage all of the fisheries in the state. And I, it occurred to me that maybe this concept of co-management that Judge Bolt had talked about would make sense. Uh, that was not a very popular decision. Uh, in the state of Washington at that time. It was not a, a, a popular decision to even talk to the tribes at that time. Uh, going from 3 to 50 percent, uh, 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 as Charles said, uh, meant a lot of people weren't fishing. And so, so the concept uh, inside our agency was not terribly uh, favorable to the idea of managing in cooperation with the tribes. But out of Port Ludlow, we decided to conduct a pilot project in 1984 where we managed the Puget Sound fisheries together. Now, some of you may remember we had uh, basically a court management system established at that time. Judge Bold had virtually had to take over the the management of the fisheries in the late 70s because the state uh, wasn't uh, responding and uh, uh, to to uh, to the the edicts of the court and so the court management system we were in court virtually all the time in 1981 82 and 83 uh, during my first three years at the fisheries department in 1984 we we agreed to do it together. And we had a facilitator, uh, Jim Waldo, uh, who held meetings uh, almost all week, every week during the summer season in 1984. And we actually managed the season with, uh, with uh, three fisheries advisory board decisions where the court actually had to intervene and, and, and decide. Uh, how a season would would be set. Uh, the year before, we'd had 77 uh, fisheries advise, advisory board decisions. But we managed that fishery together. Uh, none of the of the the uh, none of the season was set by the courts, ba basically, except for in three small small issues. And and at the end of that season. We looked at each other and said, we're not only going to do this again next year, we're going to do it for all the years in the future. And we're going to do it everywhere in the state of Washington. Uh, again, wasn't very popular, but we were starting to get to know each other. Raleigh and I uh, would have breakfast with Jim Heckman and Billy about every other week, and we we were we were getting to to know each other. We were were forming relationships, but but Port Ludlow was the launching pad for serious relationships with almost all of the Puget Sound tribes, and 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 a number of the coastal tribes started to 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 copy that uh, the the following year. At the same time, uh, in 1983. Three, when, when I took over, we were in the throes of trying to negotiate a treaty with, with, with Canada, uh, the Pacific Salmon Treaty. And in 1983, the U.S. And, and Canadian negotiators actually came to an agreement uh, uh, with each other for the first time. They, they, 
the U.S. And, and Canada had been negotiating for 18 years in 1983, and Lee Alverson and Mike Shepard were the lead negotiators for the two countries. They came to an agreement uh, in 1983. That agreement went to D.C., and it, and it virtually died in D.C. Billy Frank and Tim Wapato called me up uh, that spring and said, we're in trouble, we're going to lose the treaty, and, and, uh, and we don't, don't think we can stop it, and, and uh, stop, stop the federal government. We don't think that Reagan is even, uh, President Reagan is even going to send the treaty to the Senate for confirmation, for ratification. We had worked so hard on getting that treaty. We hit, we we uh, didn't have time to do the political work necessary to get it ratified by the Senate. And uh, basically, one Alaska senator, Ted Stevens, was able to kill kill that that treaty in 1983. Uh, uh, that summer. Uh, when we knew the treaty was dead, Tim Wapato from the Columbia River tribes uh, called uh, for a meeting with Billy and me in, in Seattle, Washington. And we didn't know what Tim was up to, but we knew he was really upset about, about losing the treaty. It was a huge deal for, for Columbia River Chinook, and it was a huge deal for Puget Sound. Uh, it was a bit because of the problems of intercepting fish in Canada. And when we got uh, to Seattle, Tim basically said, my board wants us to put together a political oper operation uh, so that what happened to us in Washington, D.C. doesn't happen again, because we need a U.S.-Canada treaty. Billy said, what can we do? And, and uh, as always, I mean, that was always Billy's response. What can, what can we do about it? And, and I said, look, I, I'm embarrassed. I went to the governor, got the governor's support for the, for, the, for the treaty. And I think we screwed up, guys. I think I screwed up. I didn't do the, the political things that I needed to do to get this treaty ratified. Uh, Billy quickly admitted that he had not done the, done the same thing. And, and Tim said, neither did I. And we said, we have got to build a coalition of interests, a coalition of interests that won't allow this to happen again. And Billy said, William, he always called me William, and I, uh, the only person that called me William in, in my life was my mom when she was really pissed at me. <laughs> but Billy called, I, I, don't, I never asked him why he called me William, but he did. He says, William, we've got to get political about this thing. The key word there was we. We've got to get political about th this thing. And we need to form a coalition of interests that is going to make that senator in goddamn Alaska understand we got some power down here. We got some power down here, too. And so about a week later, Tim Wapato <laughs> called, called me on the phone and says, I've got the staff lined up for this new coalition that you're going to form? And, and I said, no, we're going to form it, Tim. We're going to form it. He said, I've got the support of, full support of my board. I talked to Billy this morning. Billy, Billy's got the full support of his commissioners. And we're going to form a political coalition. And B William, you are going to get non-Indian interests involved in this coalition. Okay, to make a long story short, we formed a U.S.-Canada coalition. A young man named Tom Jensen, whom many of you knew, 
Uh, Tom, Tom staffed that coalition. And we got non-Indian interests. We got environmental groups. We got every tribal interest in, in the state. And we got help from Alaska Native corporations. We built a coalition that was just absolutely airtight and strong to get a salmon treaty. And then we went to Washington, D.C., once we'd formed this coalition in 1984, during what they called the El Nino crisis, the worst salmon season in history, 1984. Uh, I happened to be hung in effigy in just about every, every uh, coastal town in Washington and actually uh, right in front of my office in, in Olympia a few times after that season, where we virtually shut down the ocean fishery and we virtually shut down our own fisheries. Uh, it was the worst salmon fish, fi fishing uh, season in history. But at the same time, we, were, we took our coalition for the first time to Washington, D.C., and that coalition told the State Department, the Reagan administration, and all of the senators that were going to need, need to be available, to, that, that we were there, we, we existed, and we wanted a damn treaty. We wanted a damn treaty with Canada, and we were re ready to go back to the negotiating table. Well, when, when the 20 of us showed up in Washington, D.C. with something positive to say and do for the salmon at a time when there was an El Nino crisis going on, you, you'd have thought, uh, well, let's just say we were well received in Washington D.C., and we had non-Indian interests. The two, the co-chairs of the U.S. Canada coalition were, were, was a guy named Mark Cedargreen, who was a charter boat fisherman and out of Westport, non-Indian, and Tim Wapato, uh, who was the head of the tribal, uh, the Columbia River and her tribal fish commission, and Tom Jensen was was the staff. And that coalition went to work on a project to save the salmon. Pretty simple message. And we used the U.S.-Canada agreement. They reopened the talks, and in 19, early 1985, we signed the first Pacific Salmon Treaty. Uh, and I, they're, they're probably re renegotiating it as we speak. At least it's, it's, it's due for its third signing here pretty soon. I, and I haven't followed it, but, but I will tell you, the key to what we did at that time was, was, was we, we, we went through the 84 season together, working with the Fish Commission, working with all the Puget Sound tribes. We survived that season, again, the worst in history, we, we formed a coalition that got us a treaty with Canada, and we basically put the cement, a, a, a bastion around each ourselves, and agreed that we were going to co-manage long into the future. Okay. So I'll take you just real quickly through one other uh, aspect, but the bottom line here is, that between 1983 and 1986, not only did we start co-management, not only did we get a treaty that had been negotiated for more than 20 years with the Canadians, not only did we start the, the North of Falcon process with the federal agencies on, uh, that's going on right now, uh, goes on every March and April, we also started to focus on fish habitat and the importance of fish habitat. And the w way we did that was we focused on the timber industry. And I, I know Mark Doma is here today, uh, and uh, um, who's, who, who uh, replaced me at the Washington Forest Protection Association. I did, did that at the end of my career. And, um, and uh, uh, we, 
started negotiations uh, again with us and and the the state of Washington uh, and the land commissioner and and uh, and Billy Frank and we negotiated the, the first TFW agreement in 1986. Um, all of that happened for only one reason. All of that happened because of Billy Frank and his leadership. And it's important for the, I, I, I liked the way Charles ended his talk. You know, we've come a long ways. We came a long ways because of this, this person's leadership but we came a long ways because of a lot of the people in this room decided to step up and put the resource first. Okay? Billy always said, the sal there's two things important to me. Protecting and enhancing the salmon and the treaty rights of the tribes. Well, the fact of the matter is, those treaty rights have given the state great power as well if we chose to do it with the tribes and i i truly believe that the that that i you know and i haven't followed this issue closely today so i don't know what state tribal relationships are like uh i don't know what what uh, the relationships with the federal agencies are anymore but I also see here today kind of the, how are we gonna proceed in working together again like we did back then, okay? It wasn't easy to work together, it's never easy. But if you think about fish management, you know, I had relationships with, necessary relationships with every federal agency when we came to managing the ocean fishery. We created a commission with Canada to jointly manage those fi fisheries, okay, and, and from Alaska uh, down to California. We, we have a compact with Oregon as to how to manage the Columbia River, and we've included the tribes, have started to include the tribes in that, that operation. So co-management is just a fact of the fish manager's life. We manage with each other all the time. The question is, do we have the kinds of relationship that allow you to do a damn good job of it? And I think we did. I, I think I'm invited here today because we did work together and we worked hard together to make fish management work. TFW, and then later the Forest and Fish Agreement, we worked hard with all of you and the industry, I was representing the industry at the time, uh, uh, not, a, not of TFW, but Forest and Fish, we worked hard to get those agreements. We spent time together. We knew each other. We knew your needs and your interests. And by God, we got agreements, okay? We work together, and you still ha are implementing the Forest and Fish Agreement. You're still imp implementing co-management, and I would not hesitate to say, if you didn't work hard at it, there wouldn't be co-management. And if you don't work hard at it in the future, it'll fall apart. That's the bottom line. So, my credo today is if you're going to do the work that the salmon defense people want to work, I hope today you'll agree to form a coalition of interests with, with different parties, many of whom are not in this room right now. You know, if the, the, who, who thought in 1983 it would be possible for you to to join up with the Charter Boat Association, which had sued you uh, and challenged your treaty rights for years, but they saw a common interest. 
They needed to save the salmon, and they needed a treaty with Canada. And they came to work with you and helped form that coalition. Uh, Gillnetters came, came together. You know, in Forest and Fish, environmental groups came together for a while and then and didn't stick, stay the course. But, but the tribes stayed the course. The state stayed the course. And, and I'd venture to say, in a, in a world of Donald Trump or, or in the world before of, of George Bush, when, when they didn't care very much about the environment, I think people are pretty glad they signed that agreement back in, in 2000 about, about um, how to manage our force in the state of Washington. So my message to you today is get to work. Get to work and start working with your partners in the, in the venture of co-management. Co, co Not just of salmon management, but of habitat protection. Get to work. I don't give a damn. I mean, I do give a damn. I hope, I hope you've, you've, you prevail on the culvert case. It's time for the state of Washington to start fixing culverts. And it's time for the federal government to reinvigorate our hatchery systems, our, our, the, the way we manage uh, uh, our, our harvests. We can, we can do all of this, folks. You know how to do it. You have all the technical skills. Billy said it right there on, on the screen t today. It ain't all bad. It, but it can be so much better. And it, it, it's going to take leadership. You know, you, you, when Billy died, we, we, we lost our spokesman. We lost our spiritual leader. But we didn't lose our leaders. The young people that, that Glenn introduced this morning, it's time for you to take over. It's time for you to say enough. They're say, look at what the young people are doing this week or the last few weeks on, on gun, gun control. They've, they've brought, it, brought it back to life, okay, in our country. So we can do all of this. We can, we can protect our salmon. We can enhance our salmon. And, but, but the key word, go back to the, to the statement that Billy made in 1983 when we decided to form a coalition. We have to do this. We, not just the tribes, not just the environmental groups, not just the state, not just the feds. We all need to do this. So we need to focus on the salmon again. They deserve our attention. They deserve our love. And they deserve our togetherness. And with that, I'll stop preaching. But it's time to get to work. I want to thank these two for their commitment to the resource, to the cause, and their dedication, lifetime commitments. We have an opportunity here for some questions from the audience, if anybody has any questions. we got a couple mics here going to be passed around after all these years. Now is your opportunity back here. My name is Ed Johnstone. I'm a Quinault tribal member, fisheries policy, and born into the community of our way of life and our culture, born, to, born a fisherman, born on the Pacific coast, and grew up in the village of Tahola, Ho River, La Push, Macaw, all through Puget Sound and witnessed myself where we were in 1953 when I was born 
but my memory goes back to 1957 when I could remember my grandfather, my arm around him in a 1957 Ford, and he was taking me to go get an ice cream cone. And that same year, I was in kindergarten in Suquamish because my mother was with Chief Kitsap Kulti. And I was blessed to go to all these communities and, and I really didn't know what I was seeing. <clears throat> but later on, I, I understood where we were in 1960. We were surviving. We worked together. We fished wherever the fish were, village to village, town to town, reservation to reservation. And in the summer, we went to the berry fields and we picked berries, big encampments, villages from all over the coast, up in Alberton, Puyallup Valley. It was the same here, Whatcom County, Snohomish, Wherever, that's where, we, that's where we went, we were surviving. And along this trail, you get to the fact that we went to Cork, and we know what it was like for Billy and those warriors, men and women warriors, villages, communities, telling the story of that survival. Great stories that those people that were leading us about that survival trail of existing, winning a right of our off-reservation fishing rights something that we retain through those treaties. And these two men up here talking about the legal aspect and, and then you have Bill up there talking about when we changed I got to witness all of that. I got to be there. I got to be in the room. I got to follow all those great leaders. And, you know, from my village, it was guys like Guy McMines, my brother, Joe Delacruz, Jim Hart, and then the ones that he mentions, names like Kinley, and you would hear Peterson, and you would hear Govan and Jones, and you would hear these names because that's who those leaders are and were. And I wanted to thank Charles for being the friend that is able to tell our story in some of those books and can articulate where we were in those case in those court cases, part of that memory. And Bill, you know, you're not giving yourself enough credit. As one that stood in that room when Bill told his staff, I don't want to hear that anymore. And if you don't want to go with us in the new paradigm of co-management, there's the door. Right there. He was telling them, I don't want you. We're not doing the same old BS anymore. That's the leadership that he provided from the directorship. Uh, that he was mentoring under someone like the former director that he mentioned, Raleigh Schmitten. I'm proud to say these are my friends. I admired their tenacity, willing to go outside the box 
to take the ridicule, to feel the threats, to look at the, the, your image burned in effigy because they don't want to hear that anymore. We're going to work this out. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate that. I appreciate that you can come and share with us because I think that's the message for me out of a meeting like this is telling our story, you look around, we're looking at the young, the new generation, and you can't go forward unless you know your past. And we aren't telling a very, we are not letting our young people know how hard it was. Where we have come from, we didn't, this, this beautiful building, it's like, I don't want to say it as crass as this, but it's like, take it for granted. We didn't wake up and this building was here. It took a lot of dang work. The foundation that built this casino is the foundation of that treaty, that sovereignty, that process that gets us to be prosperous is based on that relationship with the United States, that sovereignty, the sovereignty to govern ourselves, to sovereignty to share in the economy just like the non-treaty folks. That's why they couldn't deny us these kinds of opportunity, economic sovereignty, built on the backs of who we are as fishing people. We fought hard to protect those treaty rights and we're still fighting every day. We're going to fight at three o'clock, some of us, with the United States over our treaty rights. We have got to tell our story so it's understandable, so we can pass it on to the warriors to take it to the next step. And that's what I would like to see coming out of a summit. This is going to be our report card. And we'll be able to evaluate it. But I need someone to pass on the knowledge that was given to me by my brother and by my Uncle Billy. I have to have someone to pass that to. I have to help mold these next leaders. And we have to stand them up. That's the report card that I want to see. Are there any other questions? We're in the back. Uh, good morning. I'm here for the karaoke portion. Is that? <laughs> hey. <laughs> uh, first, I'd, I'd be in remiss if I didn't acknowledge and thank the Tulalip tribe for hosting us this morning. And, and I always am thankful for somebody that feeds me. So hi, Chika, for that. Uh, I'm a party crasher. I, I, it was a last minute um, last minute decision to come here. Thanks to Daryl for uh, bringing this to my attention. And I came this morning. I'm from Musqueam. And back home we say political prisoner 55000032101. The Canadians in here that would understand and acknowledge that because it's your, your um, status card. And uh, we don't ha uh, we're still in the midst of negotiating. They established a treaty process in British Columbia in 1993. 
and we are we've realized more through litigation than we have through negotiation but that's neither here nor there I'm here to bring to your attention uh, I something that I always hear people say why reinvent the wheel uh, back in uh, September 25th of 2014 the Blackfoot of Alberta and Montana signed a bison treaty and it's a, a an intertribal uh, document where they agreed to protect uh, the grasslands and the habitat of wild bison. Uh, I know we have a Pacific Salmon uh, organization but that's government to government I think what we're talking today in the same language is, is nation, our nations to nations and that's how we need to approach this. So I'm just raising uh, the notion that there's something in existence already where the tribes of, I don't even want to call them that, I, I want to call them the Blackfeet people of, of Turtle Island saying, you know what, we're going to work together to to protect uh, wild herds of bison. So I think we can do that. We can take a look at the uh, bison treaty and see what areas are um, applicable to what we're trying to do here today. And I'm very thankful. Like I, I had an opportunity to hear Billy speak on more than one occasion in, in this uh, great facility. So I, I was, uh, I keep saying I'm privileged to represent my community on the band council for the last 25 years. And after I, I say something, I will say uh, I'm thankful for your time and I'll get off my soapbox now. But is there really a karaoke session after this? Or <laughs> I'm, I want to do some Hank Williams. <laughs> hey, good looking. Okay, thank you, Heichka. That session starts way late. <laughs> um, any other questions? Well, I think the key message that comes out of here, and Bill, Bill said it in one word, we. You know, not a one of us is going to fix the issues that we're dealing with. Not a single, single entity is going to fix the issues that we're dealing with. Not one half of co-management is going to fix the issues that we're dealing with. We have to do it together. And we have to recognize that together. However it happens, it takes commitment, it takes passion, it takes thick skin, it takes vision to do this together. And, and at the end of the day, if nothing else comes out of this meeting, it's that commitment to come back together and figure out how we grow from the strengths of the past by doing this as we, doing this as one user group, protecting one environment, protecting that salmon, which ultimately protects many, many, many other aspects of our environment. We need to do it together. Billy knew that. Billy changed from that fighter to that one of bringing people together to find ways to do this together. That's Billy's message for the future. How we do that. How we do that. How we do that. We need to keep that in the forefront. I want to thank these two individuals for sitting up here. All of the history that they have of supporting tribes, supporting the vision, supporting the direction that we need for our environment, for our future, and their commitment to still be here and share that past. The words that were said, we can't go forward without knowing our past. The greatest lessons that you learn in life across the board are from your mistakes and how you correct that and go forward. We have a lot of mistakes behind us. And we can fix it because we have that experience and we have that technology to do it. We need commitment from each other. 
Thank you, individuals. Thank you, leaders. <laughs> we have some gifts for you. Thank you. So with that, we have a, a short video again. Um, it's an animated video that we'd like to show you. have got to think in the long term. We can't think in the short term. We've got to think about it for all of us, for everyone. You go out and you pray to the moon, you pray to the sun. You talk to them trees. You know, you talk to that water, you see that tide going out, you see that tide coming in. You see the animals all swimming. No, everything is good when that's happening. When them animals come down to see you and talk to you and then leave and, and migrate out into the ocean. And they come back again next year. The salmon has to have access to that river. Way up into them upper reaches of the watershed where the water's cold. Then they have to come migrate back out to sea hit the ocean, they go clean up the Lucian Islands, and the stars guide them back here. The stars guide them right back to that river. The Indian had everything here. The Indian had his medicine. The Indian had his drums and his music. And he was in art, he was in dance, and he had everything. We knew the white man was coming over the mountain long before he ever got here. And we welcomed him, you know. And what sustained him here? What sustained him? The salmon sustained his life. He was hungry, you know, when he was starving to death. But there was so much food. He didn't know what was poison and what wasn't until the Indian told him. And uh, he didn't even know how to catch fish. He didn't know how to survive. He did survive, you know. But uh, the Indian was the help along the way. We don't walk on this earth very long. And we got a lot of changes that are happening here in this century. And we have to work together and remind each other about what was the past and our history and be able to live together and survive together. Help your tribes and help your people. Be something that you can spend a lifetime helping. And you can make a difference. You can make a big difference in the world, just one person. 
if you got a thought process of a long, long thought into the next hundred years. So it never stops, it continues on. We've always been told that we've got a short time on this earth as we walk. So try to make things better as you walk on this earth. I keep waiting for Billy Frank action figures. <laughs> I might even play with one of those if he's fishing. <laughs> so, we'd like to call forward Kathy Fletcher. She is a native of the Pacific Northwest and a lifelong advocate of the environment, especially her beloved Salish Sea, from the southern end of Puget Sound to the northern extent of Straits of Georgia and beyond. In 1991, she founded People for Puget Sound, which she headed for 20 years. Now retired, she sits on the board of, of the Georgia Strait Alliance and spends most of her time in British Columbia. Kathy chaired the Puget Sound Water Quality Authority, a state agency formed in 1985 to develop a comprehensive plan to clean up and protect the Puget Sound Straits. During the Carter administration, she served on the White House domestic policy staff where she handled environmental and natural resource issues. She has ta taught environmental policy and nonprofit management at the University of Washington. She also worked for the environmental organizations in Washington, D.C. and Colorado and helped environmental energy conservation and other programs at Seattle City, City Light. Kathy has served on many nonprofit organization boards including the National Sierra Club and the Restore America's Estuaries. She also helped create and serve on the Northwest Straits Commission for many years. Now this is a lady that stays active and she has a lot of history and a lot of commitment through the years and I wanted to do it justice to talk about that by reading her full bio that she had in place. So please welcome Kathy Fletcher here to the mic. Thank you very much, Glenn. I'm honored to be here today. Thank you, Sam and Defense, for putting this meeting together. President Sharp, distinguished elders, leaders, speakers, and participants. And thank you to the Tulalip tribes and the other sponsors for hosting this gathering. Let me also thank Billy Frank for being my friend and my inspiration for many years. I know I'm not alone in saying how much I miss him. It makes me happy to see so many people committed to carrying on his legacy. And thank you to all of you for everything that you do for our sound and for our salmon. I think one of the reasons that I was invited here today is that I've been around long enough to know where we've come from in this long battle to save our sound and our salmon. But since I'm retired, I can also say whatever I want. So you'll get my unvarnished thoughts. Puget Sound is one of the wonders of the world. Blessed with awesome beauty, literally thousands of amazing creatures from orcas to nudibranchs, amazing glaciers, rivers, estuaries, and yes, salmon. Signs of trouble in this paradise didn't suddenly appear in the 1980s. Indeed, most of the forests had been stripped a hundred years earlier. The huge and abundant salmon were overfished even then. Dams, pulp mills, fossil fuels, shipbuilding, airplane building, urbanization, leaded gasoline, and human sewage have all left their mark over the years. 
But even in the 1970s, when, when tribal fishing rights were affirmed, as we've talked about this morning, most people were focused on how to share the fish, not so much on whether there were going to be fish to share. In the 1980s, some people began to ask, how healthy is our sound? Deformed and diseased bottom fish were found in our highly contaminated urban bays. Shellfish harvesting was restricted to fewer and fewer clean areas. People were questioning the conventional wisdom that sewage from outfalls into the sound was magically flushed out to sea. Remember the cleanup of Lake Washington in the 1960s? That miracle was accomplished by gathering all the sewage and piping it over to Puget Sound. The Puget Sound Water Quality Authority was set up as an advisory body by the legislature and Governor John Spellman in 1983. It was charged with taking a look at the condition of Puget Sound and making appropriate recommendations. After a year of intense work, the authority said that because of the many jurisdictions and levels of government and the complexity of the Puget Sound ecosystem, somebody needed to develop and implement a comprehensive management plan. In 1985, the next governor, Booth Gardner, and the legislature transformed the Puget Sound Authority into a state agency with, with tight deadlines to come up with a management plan in less than two years. That plan would be the roadmap to restoring Puget Sound health by the year 2020. Hard to believe, but that was 33 years ago. The 1986 plan was based on a credible and informative state of the sound report, a dozen or so in-depth issue papers on topics ranging from oil spills to non-point source pollution, and extensive involvement of tribal, state, federal and local governments, businesses, environmental organizations, and the general public. At the time, this 1986, it was felt that Puget Sound was still an amazingly productive ecosystem, but past damage like toxic sediment contamination was in urgent need of cleanup, and many threats loomed on the horizon. The plan called for many regulatory and investment actions to protect and restore habitat, to stop pollution, and to manage land use and transportation, especially in view of the stunning population growth projections. Well received, it was a comprehensive attempt to say what needed to be done by whom and by when. When I say well received, I mean that it was acknowledged to be a good plan. However, when it came time to actually do what it called for, that is another story. Many business interests and politicians assumed that the report would join the many others on the proverbial shelf. The Puget Sound Water Quality Authority would hold meetings and do a lot more talking, and life would go on as usual. When the authority made life uncomfortable by actually insisting that actions be taken, the answer was not to get serious about getting the job done, but rather to reorganize, tame, and rename the authority. In case you missed any of the bureaucratic shuffles along the way, a simplified version is that the authority became the action team, the action team became the partnership, and not surprisingly, each new iteration came with new cycles of relocating, restaffing, blue ribbon commissions, advisory committees, public hearings, comment periods, studying and restudying, planning and replanning. However, none of these do-overs resulted in materially different conclusions about what needs to be done to save the sound. One of the criticisms of the original Puget Sound Plan was, was that it was too comprehensive, too much, too many laundry lists, not enough sense of priorities. That sentiment left to the oft-quoted desire to pick the low-hanging fruit or to implement so-called early actions as the years have unfolded, fragmentary, voluntary actions have largely substituted for systematic implementation of the plan. Many positive actions have been undertaken, to be sure, some of which are truly remarkable. But the long and short of it is, there's been no overall accountability for the original goal, a healthy Puget Sound. 
The Puget Sound Partnership dutifully reports from time to time that we are falling short. Sobering milestones along the way have included the official endangered species listings of salmon and the orcas that eat them. I remember well Governor Locke's statement in the year 2000 regarding the salmon listings that extinction is not an option. However, now our wild salmon, especially Chinook, are close to being museum pieces. And last year, the goal of a healthy sound by 2020 was officially abandoned. In addition to having a plan to protect and restore Puget Sound, the salmon listings spawned restoration plans for each river system. These plans have in turn led to many positive steps, especially regarding protection and restoration of riparian and estuary habitat. But again, no overall accountability for the goal of actual salmon recovery. As we all know, the scale of population growth, land development, pavement, toxic chemicals, plastics, and fossil fuel-based transportation have dwarfed the scale of restoration with no end in sight, except perhaps the end of salmon. Tribes have been absolutely essential to the progress we have made thus far. The tribes are to be thanked for using the Bolt 1 and 2 decisions and the Rafiti decision to go beyond catch management into water quality and habitat. Counterproductively, the state has fought the tribes at various points along the way, dating, of course, back to the original Bolt case, but more recently on the issue of removing culverts and in the muddling of the Hearst case regarding groundwater withdrawals. An encouraging development along the way has been the evolving consciousness that Puget Sound is part of a larger Salish Sea, encompassing the Strait of Georgia, the Strait of Juan de Fuca, the waters around the Gulf and San Juan Islands, as well as Puget Sound. Cross-border conversations about our shared waters began in the 1980s and have become routine. Trans-border collaboration has particularly underscored the importance of using science to inform policy. Salmon, orcas, and the ever-present risk of an oil spill remind us every day that, hap that what happens on one side of the border happens to us all. The biggest new threat from the Canadian side is the proposed tripling of the Kinder Morgan pipeline's capacity, which would dramatically increase oil tanker traffic uh, in the Salish Sea. As hard as it might have seemed, Installing sewage treatment was the easy part of saving Puget Sound. There was federal funding and state cigarette tax money, remember the cigarette tax, and it pretty much got done. But we've never really had the stomach to take on toxic pollution and habitat loss. These two problems were deemed essentially irreversible by the prestigious 1994 BC Washington Transboundary Science Panel. Yet, the state's water quality permit program under the so-called National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System has never significantly ratcheted down on toxic discharges. This, despite convincing and alarming research by federal scientists Dr. Don Malins and Dr. Usha Varanasi as far back as the 1980s when they documented the effects on the food chain of toxic contaminants in the food chain. This, Despite, despite explicit provisions in the 1986 Puget Sound Plan. Some big sediments cleanups did get done, many with habitat restoration as part of the project, like most of Commencement Bay, which we should feel really good about. But it's been 30 years after the state cleanup law and nearly 40 years after federal Superfund. In my humble opinion, every urban bay should have been cleaned up by now and we're still adding toxics to the system. One of the leading culprits in toxic contamination is stormwater runoff. There's been much talk and quite a bit of action to address this, but look around you almost anywhere in the Puget Sound Basin. There's more pavement carrying more cars than ever before, a lot less vegetation, and clearly inadequate land use standards and controls to take care of runoff either its quality or its quantity. And habitat loss? 
Lost habitat is usually lost forever. Recovering habitat is expensive and opportunities are limited. Removing the Elwha dams and reflooding in the Nisqually and, the St and Snohomish River deltas are wonderful success stories. But how many more places in Puget Sound can this be done? The goal of no net loss of critical nearshore habitat can't be met when the State Department of Fish and Wildlife can't even enforce its hydraulics permit program. If we don't protect shorelines where forage fish spawn and juvenile Chinook rear, if we don't open streams and creeks to spawning habitats blocked by culverts, if we take more water out of streams, then we simply can't restore our native salmon. Remember the mantra of the four H's, hatcheries, hydro, harvest, and habitat as the factors limiting wild salmon recovery. How many of these limiting factors continue to limit recovery? Although there is still talk of taking early actions and picking the low-hanging fruit, it's obvious that the hour is now late and that even the hardest fruit to reach is critical to Puget Sound health and salmon recovery. To bring in a metaphor from an ecosystem far away, the biggest elephant in the room is our changing climate. Most of our planning has taken place without accounting for increased temperatures, more intense storms, more rain, less snow, more prolonged droughts, rising sea levels, and ocean acidification. So now what? Let me ask you, how do we reconcile giving up on the goal of a healthy Puget Sound by 2020 without doing everything in our power to do the things that could make that a reality, if not in 2020, then on a new urgent timetable? We know what to do. Actually, we've known what to do for decades, but we have failed to garner the political will to make it happen. We have fallen into do loops of planning and studying Studies and plans are important and needed, but not as a substitute for solving the problems they illuminate and taking the actions they recommend. An authority with no real authority, an action team with little action, a partnership that has squandered resources and social and political capital. We have accomplished a lot, and we're doing a lot more for Salmon and the Sound but we need to face the fact that while we've slowed the rate of decline, we're not getting where we need to go. In a word, we are failing. Through all these years, public comments have been utterly consistent, indeed repetitive. Stop talking so much and take action. Adequately fund what needs to get done. Enforce existing laws. Use local knowledge and resources, and don't create more government layers. Instead, we've gotten more plans and studies, and process upon process. How many meetings have we all attended where some holy grail of the ever better ecosystem indicators, the ever more detailed risk analysis, or the ever more complete study has been discussed ad nauseum, while the pollution the habitat destruction and the climate change continue. Now we face climate change largely outside of our region's control, ocean acidification that will change the fundamentals of our ocean chemistry, and the possible extinction of southern resident killer whales dependent on the same Chinook we have failed to recover. Insufficient funding for Puget Sound recovery has plagued the effort from the beginning but it's a little too easy to start and stop with this problem to explain where we are today. Inadequate funding is just another way of saying lack of political will. And funding has never just been an issue of how big a check will come from the state or from the feds. There are many pieces to the funding issue. Direct government funding for sure, both to support the staff necessary to get the job done and to pay for on the ground actions like habitat restoration. But there are also requirements for private expenditures to clean up and prevent pollution if our laws were being enforced, rate-based funding for sewage and stormwater management to spread the responsibilities as it should be around to all of us, and charitable donations as well. 
And think about the fact that strict enforcement of our environmental laws doesn't cost much more. In fact, it might cost less than the lengthy negotiations and compromises with polluters. It's not all about money. It's about will. Nobody said it would be easy to restore the sound and bring back our salmon. Here's a list of possible actions. No more shoreline hardening. Anticipate sea level rise by creating natural buffers at the water's edge. Stop withdrawals of groundwater affecting salmon streams. Remove the dams and culverts blocking streams and spawning habitats. Consider a moratorium on Chinook harvest. Ban farming of Atlantic salmon. Oh, wait, we did that. Uh, <laughs> Stop the flow of persistent toxic chemicals. Complete the cleanup of Puget Sound's toxic sediments. Drastically reduce runoff from land and infrastructure development, both existing and new. Stringently enforce and regulate vegetation removal requirements, including forest practices. It's important to keep the focus on restoring a self-sustaining ecosystem, so I would caution against relying too much on hatcheries. Just as hatcheries were once seen as the answer to dams and fish farms, the answer to extinction, relying on hatcheries overmuch now could end up excusing a lack of action on the bigger challenges ahead. So which actions can we come around together to take to achieve restoration of native salmon and Puget Sound? Can we tackle the big underlying challenges of reducing our human footprint on the land, of ending our dependence on fossil fuels and plastics, and of closing the cycle on waste of all forms? We are way, way beyond being able to reach only for the low-hanging fruit. Exactly one day after I was born 68 years ago, the Seattle PI ran an editorial called A Good Start, and they weren't talking about my birth. <laughs> they were applauding a move by the State Pollution Control Commission to require four major pulp mills to install sulfite waste controls in order to preserve Puget Sound salmon. The PI had just run a series of articles a, month, a few months earlier on what it called, quote, the alarming depletion of one of the most important of the state's natural resources, unquote. They were talking about salmon. The 1950 editorial concludes by saying, if the same spirit is shown by all of the other interests involved, it is safe to predict that eventually every obstacle will be overcome and our priceless salmon will be preserved for both the pleasure and profit of posterity. They didn't say when eventually might be. I'm pretty sure no one then imagined it would be later than the year 2020. And it's pretty clear that the spirit hasn't yet been shown by all of the other interests involved. And yet, in spite of it all, I think it is still possible to save Puget Sound it's salmon, it's orcas, it's biodiversity, and yes, it's people. Let's just not be overwhelmed by the size and complexity of the task. Let's be clear-eyed and frank about what's right and what's wrong for the sound and for the salmon. When, when sustainability first became a thing in the 1980s, the UN set up a commission chaired by the former Norwegian Prime Minister, Gro Harlem Brundtland, their 1987 report, Our Common Future, defines sustainable development as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the needs of future generations to meet theirs. Turning that definition into action, the idea is to ask at every decision point, does this help or does it hurt? Does it move in the right or in the wrong direction? If it moves in the right direction, okay. But if it moves the other way, don't do it. It's kind of the environmental version of the question, what would Jesus do? Let's take inspiration from the salmon themselves. Their innate abilities to explore, populate, and thrive. Remember, 
They came here as the glaciers receded, looking for a place that could meet their needs. And in turn, they contributed to our amazing forest and water ecosystems. If given half a chance, and if we can get together to do it, they will survive and thrive again. If only we humans give them that chance. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy, for that history. <clears throat> Sometimes it's hard to hear uh, all the failings. Seems like a, a daunting task to um, correct the wrongs of the past. So I'm glad you came back to It's Not Impossible. I was getting worried. <laughs> but that's, that's why we're here. It's trying to understand how we continue to stay focused on healing the Salish Sea, healing Puget Sound, and um, not lose sight that it is possible, not be overwhelmed by the obstacles in front of us, but to stay focused on what needs to be done, not that uh, we can't do it. We got to find a way to do it. Um, I want to call, uh, we got a couple speakers we want to fill in here. Um, we had extra time, but now we're filling up time. And so, uh, I want to call um, uh, Bobby Whitener up. Bobby's the chairman of our uh, Salmon Defense. Bobby's the owner and managing member of Whitener Group. Bob has over 30 years of experience working with tribal governments and enterprises within Indian Country. In addition to having run tribal corporations and governments, he has extensive experience in natural resource management, finance administration, human resource systems, tribal state compact negotiations, policy development, federal negotiations. Bob is an enrolled member of Squaxin Island. I think we just have Bobby do everything. <laughs> Thanks, Glenn. You actually have to come back up because... <laughs> sort of speech I that, that, that is the shortest time Bobby's ever talked. This is what you call a fluid agenda. <laughs> so, um, we have Chief. Paul Balas, uh, Ernest Alfred from uh, First Nations, asked him to come up and he's got some words he'd like to share about the issues that they are dealing with uh, across the border. You come as so. Ah, Mula Mumu Kala Kila la Gahano, Tlelo Nalami Kosalish Ola Gala Kila Kesla Kila la Gahano Nuguam Kwakwa Balas Gayukin Laha Wina Guisas Namkis Kwa kwa kiwag. Mamalila kala. 
My name is Kwak Abalas. My English name is Ernest Alfred, and I've traveled a great distance to be with all of you uh, today. This is my niece, CM, and I've asked her to join us. I want to uh, thank the good people of this land for opening their doors to us and asking us to participate. I, uh, I'm really honored to, uh, to stand here on behalf of our people, our nations. I bring greetings from my chiefs and elders, and I've been guided by them to speak on this particular issue of fish farms in our territory. Some of you are aware of uh, the fish farm problem, and we came here to fully support the nations here with this battle. We're also here to ask for your support and your solidarity. Uh, 208 days ago, my niece and I stepped out onto a fish farm and we brought our tents and our sleeping blankets and we declared an occupation. This was the same day that the Cook Aquaculture Farm in your territory fell apart and collapsed and spilled all of that mess into our waters, our shared ter territorial waters. So I know how long ago that was, that was August 24th, because every day we count the days. And we've been parked at the Swanson Island Fish Farm, uh, I believe today is 208 days. And we've watched and we've exposed this industry for what it is. And it's illegal. They've never asked us. They've never gotten our consent. And zero consultation. In fact, my people have not only, not only uh, protested this industry in our waters, we've actively tried to get rid of them. We've tried to evict them, and they're not listening to us. And the Canadian government, the federal and provincial government, have to be held accountable. The previous governments had no time to hear what we had to say about the issue. And things are changing in, in, in our country. Now we have the federal government and the provincial government um, claiming they want reconciliation with the First Nations people in our, in our, in our country. A new relationship. Consent-based decision-making is the, some of the key words that are being thrown around right now. So, where's the proof of this reconciliation? Where's the proof of this new relationship that they're calling uh, for in our area? I want to give you a little update. I come from, my status card says Numkis First Nation, but I represent many people and all of the people up and down the coastline when, when we say we want the fish farms out. The Numkis First Nation have uh, filed a lawsuit against the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and Marine Harvest. Tomorrow we go before a judge in Vancouver, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, and we hear what the judge has to say, so we're cautiously optimistic about this process because we've been wronged before by these courts. So we're asking for some help. Uh, tomorrow uh, we'll, do, we'll hear what the judge has to say if we have a case to bring, us, bring on a suit, a lawsuit. And we will also hear if the judge decides to um, grant the injunction that we're filing for to keep Atlantic salmon out of the Swanson Island fish farm. Either way, whatever this judge decides, it's going to be impactful. You can guarantee there's going to be trouble on the water if, he doesn't, if this judge doesn't uh, agree with our people. And so we're asking for your support. What I would like to do is, um, is present this document to all of you. 
and your leadership and your elders and your organizations and your and your your signatures so that we can take this to the judge and we can take this back to our people it's uh, could be addressed to your government but it also could be addressed to ours and i quote as stewards of mutual territory on both sides of canada the united states border we understand we the undersigned are united in dismantle demanding <laughs> I should put my glasses on <laughs> demanding that the governments of Washington state and British Columbia est establish consistency of law to ban all open net Atlantic salmon farms it is our position that ex existing or future open net Atlantic fish farm operations are unlawful in our shared territories in the absence of free and prior informed consent. Given our documented concerns towards the cumulative and collective impacts of fish farms on indigenous salmon populations, we call for an immediate halt to the restocking of fish farms and the cancellation or decline to renewal of permits of all remaining fish farm leases along the west coast of North America. Our, this, uh, this document wouldn't be the first time our people cooperated with one another. My brothers and sisters to the south of us, we hold our hands up to you because of the strong, strong stand that you've taken against this industry. Uh, the tenure renewals in our territory, known as the Broughton Archipelago, are all up there. I think there's 20 of them that are all up for renewal in June. One third of the industry farms in BC are in our territory without our consent. And so we're asking the province of British Columbia very, very respectfully and easily to let those tenures expire. Because that one third is a big chunk of this cancer in our water. This com these companies cannot, this industry cannot sustain itself if they lose one third of their farms and, and that, that does not go with their business model and they'll be forced to take another look. And so we ask for your support. We're going, uh, I, I have to thank all of the, the people that have, have made this uh, possible for, for us to be here and to produce this. Uh, it was very last minute. Uh, this is uh, because of the court uh, actions, I was sent home. I was told to leave the occupation and take a break, so this is how I'm spending my vacation with, with you fine people. Um, and so I, I, this was quite unexpected, and, and, and we couldn't be more honored and, and pleased to be in this beautiful building. Um, and, and we're also very, so very proud of the work that the uh, state of Washington is doing to remove fish farms out of their territory. We want to do this together because BC cannot continue to allow this. BC would become the only place on the entire west coast of North America to allow this industry to continue to operate in that manner. We're not opposed to fish farms. In fact, the Numkis First Nation spent $4 million building a closed containment facility called Kutera. It has its challenges. I understand that if it was built a lot bigger, then this, uh, this, these companies might, might have taken a, a, better, a cl closer look at closed containment. But that's the way of the future. They're doing that in Norway. They're doing that uh, in elsewhere. I hear that Maine um, is, is, is doing the same thing. And so we're encouraged by that because there's nobody cleaning up their mess in our waters. It's quite disturbing what we see. And you know what? 
our fish are disappearing. I'm not talking about the Fraser River run. That Fraser River saw a lot of your salmon probably go up that inner passage and they pick up those diseases and those sea lice. Our problem is your problem. And I want to tell you that I think the moment we remove these farms, we're going to start seeing results. We're going to see the herring come back. We've discovered the missing King Inlet herring. We know where they are. We stuck a GoPro down into those pens and saw that herring. Nobody in the Broughton Archipelago is allowed. DFO tells us we're not allowed to touch that herring. We'll get charged. But, that, but Marine Harvest can move the herring all over our territory in those tanks and those in those vessels, those transport boats. There's one vessel up there that doesn't even have a Canadian license. It's Norwegian registered. So we're, I'm a little bit worried because our, our government has, uh, has some wishy-washy language. And so we need to turn up the heat on them. We're fighting a big monster. Everybody else, and that's why I'm so proud, everybody else around the world hasn't been able to stand up to these companies. We're fighting the richest man in Norway. A foreigner. And we're going to have to toughen up. We're going to have to start fighting back. And that's why we're here today to, to gather your support as well. We're asking everybody to write to John Horgan and to the NDP government in British Columbia, Minister LeBlanc, who's fighting us in court, so they, they can, t can continue to put diseased salmon in our waters. And so we're asking you to write to, those, uh, write to those politicians and tell them, do not renew those licenses. This needs to stop now. Our people have been doing this for 30 years with, uh, little, with little results. We're strong. There's young women standing on, on the front lines. The other day, Marine Harvest worker pu pushed my niece, physically tried to remove her so that they could serve me with a court injunction that didn't have my name on it, that didn't mention Swanson Island, and was dated December of 2017. So those are the kinds of things we're, we're trying to work towards. I'm asking everybody's support on this document that I want to send to our, our leadership back home. And I'll be proud to tell my chiefs, elders, and our children back home that we're doing, we're doing great work here. Congratulations. I'm so grateful and honored to the organizations that, and, and the people who are putting on this great event. And I'm so grateful to be, for it to have such a respected name. I'm truly honored to be here and we stand in full solidarity with all of you. Pilai Kesla, thank you very much. You know, as the chairman of, of Salmon Defense, I would like to challenge our board to make a decision to support this today. That's something we could consider. And I think the way it's written, the board will give this great. Chairman is still a Chairman is still a Sean Yang. We give our support for uh, removal of the net pen. Thank you. So as a show of solidarity against these open net pens, raising Atlantic salmon, we'd ask that all of our attendees here step forward in the center here. We're going to take a picture of us all standing together in opposition of this. So we can do that real quick. Don't. Somebody's got to be first. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Oh, for crying out loud, you're my relative. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you. 